My name's Mike Ellis. I have a problem. I rescue, refurbish, restore and revitalise vintage drums, in particular Premier drums. In this programme I'll share with you my adventures, ups and downs, ins and outs, triumphs and tragedies as I lavish some TLC on vintage British drums. Welcome to The Drum Fettler. something a little bit off piste. You know when you've got to move your kit from one place to another and you've got to make life easier? Well, you might want to use something like this. Well, not particularly this one, because it's a bit old and it's a bit rickety. Ever invented, am I? Full of ideas. I'm going to be using this and that stuff there to make a nice sexy little trolley for moving drums from, say, the shed in your back garden to the car in your front garden. Mm. You really can't beat a bit of a fresco fettleage, can you? Well, we're all ready to go here. Got my little buddy workmate here. Got uh, a couple of persuaders and a, uh, a thing that uh, my mate Nosha gave me. He doesn't need it anymore, he's on holiday. Anyway, so uh, breaking some blocks of wood down. Lots of people say to me, Mike, please don't go. I couldn't live without your. <laughs> right, well, this is as good a time as any to have a little chatty pools about the flow beam strainer. The strainer basically is a parallel action, which means when you lift up the lever, you'll see the wires lift up off the head, so they're constantly under tension. Now, the things to watch out for, we will go through a bit later, but whilst I'm just taking this HR9 apart, please observe, if you will, this here knob, right? That is called a terminal. Now, you see, this one has got flat sides. That means it is metric, it is an M8 thread. Now if I have a little route through here, somewhere I will, there we go, you will see here this is the older one which has a BSF thread and you will see that the profile of the terminal is just slanted. So that's basically something to be careful of because all the new internal parts, the 116, these things here, which often break, the old ones have BSF threads, the new ones have metric threads on this bit here, and they're also bigger, that profile is bigger, but we'll talk, we'll talk about that a bit later, but I just thought Whilst I, was, whilst I was taking this apart, it might be a good idea just to point that out, and we'll point it out again a bit later, but uh, I'll carry on with dismantling. What do you do with this, eh? Box full of 252 parts. I've got chassis, spare parts and everything. Well, I suppose the obvious thing to do is build a pedal. Well, I've already done that. With this one. Full build and resto. Nice example, Mark 1. Came up quite nicely repainted. Fully lubed, which we all like. If you like the Mark 1, that's a good example for you. It's still for sale, by the way. But, there is an alternative. If you want something a little bit more special, for example, like this. How fabulous is that? Look at that. You can't really get sexier than this, can you? This is, well, it's a customization rather than a restoration. But what makes it extra special 
is it's not just anybody who's done it. My very good friend, James Marston, who used to work at Premier at Blaby Road in the R&D department. And the 252 was, in fact, one of his babies. Now, what I really should do is jump in the van, hurtle across England, go and see him in action, eat all his biscuits, drink all his tizer, and then get thrown out. So, with all that in mind, he's done some little videos for us showing us how he actually comes up with his fabulous pedals and how he puts them all together. So we're going to be taking a look at that now! So, welcome people, this is a, a presentation of uh, how to put back together a late model 252 pedal. This came to me completely stripped down in a box and even to the point where they drilled out the rivets and the stay. Here's a quick procedure as to how to put this lot back together. Eyes down, look in. Get the lock tight. Things that proved a little tricky. I needed more than nine pair of hands to do that, but. Uh, you uh, do drill the roots out, you can use M4 bolts in there, a bit of Loctite on the threads. Lastly, we need to stick these in, quick job this, any sort of glue, little tip, if you just spread the glue around the sticky up bit, that bit there, it aids in slipping it in the hole. There we go, all done. Next bit. Pedal to the plate. Okay, on the late models, one of these, they improved it a lot by sticking these nylon bushes into the plate, which stopped an immense amount of wear problems. I won't touch the early pedals purely because this is a big wear area. You can sometimes take the old shaft out, drill it out to 7mm, put 7mm shaft in and get away with it and it works okay but just sometimes the wear is so bad here that uh, it's just not possible. Anyway, bushes in place, the shaft has a knurled end and a plain end. As we don't know which way this came to bits, we can work out, I don't know if you can actually see that on there, inside there, you can just about make them out, awesome witness marks which prove that that end goes like that. The nylon bushes, you don't really need to grease them but I always just put a little bit in because you can't beat a well greased area. The wrong way you twit. That goes in there like that. That goes over there and with some wiggle and jiggle, jiggle for little. Get that to go all the way through, we're in, all the way across. So, deft taps with a hammer. I don't have a press, so I have to use a big hammer. These caps are pretty good. So, we're going to bend them. They're not the same, but 
they're pretty close. With a push fit by hand and it just finishes the job off nicely. What would you soon have? Got it up on the uh, work buddy mate. So now I just need to start working on the frame, which means one thing. Power tools. First thing I need to do is get rid of these little hinges on the side of the frame because I don't need those anymore. Okay, I have something approximating a plan, which I know is dangerous. As you can see here, I've got a bit of old pallet wood, and it's still got the blocks on. And what I was going to do was make the base out of these planks, and then put blocks on. So what I need to do now is get rid of these horrible nails. I've decided to go with a simple approach with hiding the nails. Seems to work. Bugger me, it fits, said the actress to the proctologist. Right, just need another one. Spring tension arm, nicely polished. Gentle tap to start it, if you notice we're not anywhere near coming through yet. Usual is lube up the hole, so to speak. We tap that through a little bit, make sure we're going in the right way, otherwise we'll look at twit. Hold it over the and eventually we get all the way through but big problem here, you've got to line that end up there with that hole there. Sometimes they don't. So, we're lucky this time because it's actually started to go through and with By hook or by crook, sometimes you have to twist and turn and tap and tweak to eventually get it in there. Not easy one that one, so take your time. Members. Righty ho, let's talk flow beam. I promised we'd talk about flow beam in the last edition of TDF, but we just didn't have time. We just couldn't cram it in with all the other exciting stuff going on. So I'm going to talk about flow beam now. Flow beam is the mechanism from most commonly known as the 2000 series of snare drums, although it does appear on marching snare drums and some other models in the 80s. And I want to go through with you the sort of problems that you may encounter whilst you are the happy and proud owner of a drum with such a mechanism. This is my 2003 snare drum. I've had it a couple of years and I got this to replace my original 2000 that I had from uh, 1970 until the late 80s in Germany when someone stole it. 
it was an aluminium shelled snare. The 2000 drums were advertised as being metal, which basically meant that they were aluminium to start with and then they went to steel. Now you can tell them apart because this is aluminium and you can see that it's got a little bit of pitting there. Often they have a lot of pitting because, as I've said before, aluminium and chrome don't like living together for very long so they will part company, but it is in my opinion the best sounding version of the drum. My 2000 I used on my very first record. Look, my first single. That's me, the little skinny spotty oik at the front. Oh, what went wrong? So if you want to go out and buy a copy of that, they sell for about £75 now. Oh, if only I'd kept that box of 100 I was given when it was released. Hey ho! For those of you who don't outlay that much, it's been re-released in a smaller version, compact disc. Back to the matter in hand. What kind of problems can you expect from a flow beam mechanism? Well, there's this. Having saggy snares or being unable to tighten them could be one of two reasons. One, you've got the wrong snares. To confuse matters, the snare wires that Premier made for the flow beam came in two lengths. They were the 0655, which was 409mm long, and the 0654, which is 428mm long. The 0655 were for drums like this, concert snares, as they were known, and the longer 0654 wires were for marching snares, but they were also used on drums like the HR9 and others in the 1980s, those with the stress rings from the HR9, which has uh, got to sort out. So if you've got a drum, your snare drum is like that and it's got a flow beam mechanism, almost certainly, well I'll guarantee it, you need the 0654 wires. It should also be noted that flow beam wires came into designs. Originally they were twin 12s, two sets of 12, like this, as you can see. Those are the little eye keyhole holes that hook over the levelling bolts and the two sets of 12 there. Sometime in the early 80s they changed it to a single set of 24 wires. If you want your drum to look original then you need the twin 12s. They're not that difficult to find original ones, they are out there and there is at least one company that makes reproductions for them. They're not cheap but they look the part and they look genuine. If you have got a concert snare like this and your wires aren't tightening up, it could be that you've got the wrong wires on. You might have been sold 0654 wires instead of 0655, so get that tape measure out and check them. Well, it's all dreadfully fascinating stuff, isn't it? Absolutely. Hope you were taking notes because I'll be asking questions later. Well, why she weren't looking? I went and had got my hammer and nails out and uh, did the side panels. Now, a lick of paint, I think. Red. Red, I think. Red. Green. Green. I have my own little pool on the state truck for transporting drums from here to there, or even from there to here. Taking my inspiration from the 1940s and 1950s American stakeside pickups, I think I've created something rather unique and interesting to move stuff around. And there we go. All loaded up. Okay, so it won't stand up to a world tour, but it's prettier than a lot of stuff you get to move your drums around with, including your horrible Euro blubby cars. Just like the one behind me. What we will do is that we'll assemble the head casting, the shaft and everything and as you can see, important bits. This bit obviously, here I had to take this to bits because it was full of khaki grease and horrid everything but you can prise that little Starlock washer off, clean all the bearing out and re-grease it and it makes a big difference. The main shaft, nicely polished, two fibre washers, very important, lock washer and the screw. Now the customer took the screw out, as you can see it's a bit mangled. I use this massive crosshead screwdriver and it fits perfectly in there, even with a damaged head as bad as that. So first job, fibre washer onto there. Next job in 
there, up against the bearing face, we have to stick the other fibre washer. Grease. Unfortunately, what it does do it makes a bit of a mess of your nicely painted head, shaft up inside. The first time you shove the shaft in, then it will come out all covered in grease. <laughs> so, what you need to do. <laughs> clean your shaft because what we don't want is any grease up there because when we put the screw in we don't want to be screwing down onto onto grease so we have to remove that wipe out with the, with the old rag on in here there's a little bevel and on the shaft which you can't see anyway take my word for it there is a bevel that matches it, so you have to mate the two up when you put it together. You find that if it's mated together, you can't turn the shaft or the crank. Lock washer, thread lock. And then we screw the two together, check for end float. We have a tiny bit of end float, which is perfect. Well oiled sewing machine. That is that. Another TDF done and dusted. We'll be back soon with more from James and the 252 build. We'll also continue troubleshooting the flow beam mechanism and we'll have other silliness and general drum fetlage for you to enjoy, digest, complain about, take medicine for, go to the doctors about, have an operation, sue me, and then we'll all live happily ever after in our old people's home. Life sometimes works out like that. <laughs>